So we are live. Um, thank you, everybody, who's connecting right now to this Lovey Letters Hangout. Actually, today we're discussing a very, very exciting uh, project, Lovey Winner, uh, from, from the last edition. We are here with Mark Fretton from Shale London, Creative Director. Uh, before we start uh, with, with the proper Hangout and questions, tell us a bit more what you do at Shale. Hi, Jen. Um, yeah, as you said, I'm a creative director. I'm also a creative lead. I'm also a writer. So at Chair, we work quite closely with Samson, um, delivering experiences that, that bring their products to life in lots of different ways. Um, that can be anything from a new product launch to uh, a CSR initiative, which is what Free Shakespeare was. So. Right, so, um, you know, regarding Reshakespeare, for those that are not uh, much aware of what the project was about, what you did, can you kind of tell the, the brief version of, of what, what it is all about? Okay, um, I guess Samson are a company from Korea, but they have a very big involvement in, in Britain. Um, one of the things they're very keen to do is to, to give stuff back. So they have an initiative called National Pride, which is basically... Um, coming up with ideas or, or activations or experiences that, that help to celebrate what Britain's all about um, and use Samson technology to, to do that. Um, Reece Shakespeare came about in the, the 450th anniversary of Shakespeare's death, um, so a very salient year to be celebrating probably the world's greatest playwright. Uh, and you know, uh, you you created a, a bunch of things, but this was mostly for students and kids, right? Yes, that's right. So um, we were very keen just not to create a, an entertainment experience, but to actually do something that would that would help if we could identify a problem. And uh, one of the problems we identified was that that um, young people at Key Stage Three, um, if they're encountering Shakespeare for the first time at Key Stage Three, um, it's a very difficult time for them and you know, they're just beginning to change and they're encountering something which uses strange language, old English, um, Shakespeare's English is not the same as our English, um, and probably talking about things that, that they're not, not that interested in if they just see it, in, you know, as a, as a kind of book like this. If they're sitting down in an English class and they open the book, what does Shakespeare mean to them now? I mean, it's, it's 450 years ago. Why is it still relevant? I guess our challenge was to try and make it relevant for a, for a generation that, that are discovering new ways of doing stuff, a, a digital generation that, that has probably seen more change in their lifetime than most people have seen in their entire lifetime. Um, how, do you, how do you develop an experience for them that uses a playwright that's 450 years old? So, yeah. Now, what is interesting is that, of course, uh, Shakespeare was a playwright, so his work was made to be performed and experienced, you know, as a performance instead of necessarily a book or written text. Um, so it's interesting. So and on one side, you're doing, you know, Shakespeare's storytelling, uh, which is 450 years old or more, uh, but using modern technology. So what were the challenges of updating something which was created for live performance in a, in a theater of sorts? by using uh, technology. And tell us a bit more about you know, the technology you use and how would people experience uh, Shakespeare? Okay, yeah, I think you, you hit the nail on the head there. Um, his work was created to be performed, but um, it, it, uh, it's become a text-based exercise sitting at a desk reading a dusty book and things. Um, but what's happened over, the, you know, over the, the last few years is that technology has given us the ability to bring performance to life in ways that we couldn't have dreamed of before. Um, before, if you wanted to see a Shakespeare performance, you'd have to get on a bus, go up to the Royal Shakespeare Theatre in Stratford um, and see a performance with, with real actors. And that is still the best way to see Shakespeare. But um, I, I guess mobile devices now, just because of the way they've developed and the way that the Android platform works, have, have given us the opportunity to actually bring elements of performance, elements of interactivity, um, into, into a, an experience that, that would augment the way that it works in school and augment actually seeing a performance itself. So, so yeah, I guess, I guess it's all out there. It's all out there. That's the thing. Um, because of the way that Android has, has developed, that it's certainly in terms of the games and, and the way that people use what, what was originally a communication device to, to, to play and interact with, it's become... A, a, a sort of real playground for creatives to to get creative um, and that's what we did with this we we thought 
how can we best take uh, uh, an uninterested student through an encounter with Shakespeare, assuming they've never seen or heard or read Shakespeare before, how can we give them an experience that that will deliver different different learning outcomes for them, uh, different and, and elicit a different learning response? Um, and what's the best way to do that? So, so I mean, I can explain a little bit about how the how the UX came about. Yes, please, please. Okay. So. Free Shakespeare is basically, it's based on three separate modules, if you like, um, each of which has its own UX and each of which delivers a different learning, uh, uh, requ requires a different learning response. Um, play, practice, perform. In play, the students encounter Shakespeare, the, the works of Shakespeare, in terms of playing with it and having fun with it, doing fun things with it, in the same way as they play on their devices, we ask them to play with Shakespeare and it, it gets them interested in it. Um, it mitigates risk because when you're playing games, you can lose and still have fun and still uh, you, you respawn or whatever. So failure is a, fear of failure is a, a very big issue, especially when you're dealing with performance. So if we introduce it with play, it's, it's fun and it gets them involved with it and they begin to play with the language. They begin to understand, oh, this language is pretty much like the language that I'm used to when I listen to to a hip hop artist, for example. So we'll take we'll take a hip hop artist, take a rapper like a Carla, and a Carla will gi will give them a game where they have to guess if it's his lyrics or if it's Shakespeare's words. Um, and you know, they, they simply look at it. They they shake the device. It brings up an option. They swipe left, swipe left, right. It's gamification mechanics that they're familiar with, but it's introducing Shakespeare in interesting ways. When they've done that, they then move on to perform uh, to to practice rather. Practice starts with a very innovative 360 degree experience that we shot on the stage with, with RSC actors at the theatre in Stratford. What this allows them to do is to, to imagine that they're at, at a live performance. Um, they can hold their tablet up, they can look around if they want, they can look at the ceiling, they can look behind them. They're not forced to, to view a certain editorial position. So um, I think that's a completely new experience for anyone Nobody's ever done that before with Shakespeare, and that was what that that was delivering compelling experiences. It's about delivering new experiences that people have never seen before. So and you're also voice, voice, right? Because, um, if you are, for example, a computer, you decide to focus on the main characters, but also you know be paying attention to different things happening around, and especially in certain setups of Shakespeare with there's multiple people on stage, you can decide which story to to, to follow or what kind of action to follow. So, yes. Uh, yeah. You're bringing it closer to the original in a way. Yes, I mean, I think it's absolutely key to the experience that, that you not only watch the person who's delivering the lines, but if you want to, you can look at how the other person is responding and things. What, what, what do those words mean to them? Because, because language is an interactive thing in itself, that there's somebody that says it and somebody that receives it. And, and I think what Shakespeare is great at doing is was creating drama out of language and things. So. So yeah, I mean, within this 360 degree space, we also created um, augmented hotspots that you could you could touch these hotspots and see, find out more information about the story, about the plot, about a theme that was coming up. Um, there was subtitles you could follow if you found the, but the English was too difficult to follow. Um, it, it was basically a very rich and interactive experience. Um, and it was it kind of pushed things to the limit I and mean, we had to get there was a third party plugin manufacturer that had to rewrite their code in order to allow us to put the hotspots where we wanted in in three dimensional space because nobody had done it before so um those small technological challenges actually make it more worthwhile in the end so um that is that is practice once once they've seen that they then meet educational uh, and performance experts who will begin to unpick a specific text. Now we chose Much Ado About Nothing because that was the play that was being performed uh, by the Royal Shakespeare Company at the time and it's also on the national curriculum. So um, we begin to look at it in terms of what the themes are in the play, what, how, how we begin to unpack language, how we begin to unpack the word play that he uses, um, uh, alliteration, those sort of things. These are very, very practical craft-based skills that, that, that young people would do in their class, but we're doing it in a fun way. So again, at the end of each of the, the 
small segments and narratives. We have a game that they play which reinforces and, and encourages sort of deeper learning. Um, and they must complete each of those three modules, which is um, with three performance experts, before they get a chance to move on to the final section, which is called uh, Perform. And in Perform, they take to the stage themselves. And what was interesting with this was we, we shot it not in 360 degree, but we shot it from POV, and we gave them the chance to select whether they wanted to be one of two characters, and they play opposite uh, and Royal Shakespeare Company actor. So the actor delivers their lines and they deliver their lines, um, but from point of view. So you can see, as you're saying the words, the effect that your words are having on that person. So if it's making them happy or sad. Um, and this is about unpacking the language in a way that it would be really difficult to do in a classroom based setting, but simply because you wouldn't have that expertise of that, that RST actor. So the RST actor is giving you the experience of being on stage. Um, and yeah, that's basically it. At the end of performance, they have a chance to go back. There's a lot of rich content that they can explore in each of the sections. Um, and a lot of the sections just stand on their own. Like there's a, there's a Shlomo, um, who's a, a beatbox, a Shlomo, um, it's a, a beatbox device where he, you set a beat and then you can take any of some Shakespeare, famous Shakespeare quotes and, and mash them up and do what you like with them. So you can press buttons to say to be or not to be that is the question. But you can also change that with a quote from Richard III and say, to be a horse, that is the question. You know, you can, you can mix it out. And I think that idea of beginning to deconstruct text and play with text and play with the language is what makes it compelling for, for an audience of this age. That's what they want to do. That's what they do want to do with technology is find their own ways of working with it. So. But also it allows them to delve deeper into the work and not just, you know, repeat what was written or just read, you know, Again, uh, a fact that has been uh, the same for, for ages, and how you know when I at school had to study Shakespeare, uh, it was reading and memorizing, and that was it, and killed a lot of the fun from it, which I started enjoying actually after school. You know, my my pleasure for you know reading or, or watching performances from Shakespeare started after school because at school it was just a chore, read yes. and memorize and then repeat and have a test about it. Now, um, this is was, was, you know, how the experience works and stuff, but let's look a, a bit in, into the behind the scenes. You know, from a brief, I don't know how, uh, if the brief already addressed Shakespeare, you know, to the technological complexity, to the fact of involving, you know, real actors performing, you know, how, how did you manage that? You know, what kind of skills did you require from, from, from your side and the team? How, how did it develop from the moment that the client said, I want to do something? Okay, so I think uh, a very key thing is it doesn't matter how big your agency is or how many amazing talented people, you would never be able to do something like the Re Shakespeare app if it was just done by a single agency. I mean, central to the whole process was collaboration. We collaborated very closely with the Royal Shakespeare Company's education department and with Unit 9, who were our tech developers on this project. Um, and each of, each of us, I guess, brought... Uh, a degree of specialization but the collaboration is what made amazing things happen from there so I mean I guess I guess choosing the right partner to start with in the Royal Shakespeare Company is very important because the Royal Shakespeare Company have a very uh, a very performance based view of how young people should encounter education so um, a lot of young people work best when they work as kinesthetic learners through through uh, through doing yeah, through performing and things rather than the abstraction of, of text and reading and stuff. If you can do it, if you can do it and you can feel it, then it goes in and it stays in. So so they brought that, I guess that spirit to everything that we did. And I guess what Unit 9 brought was this, this pioneering spirit in terms of challenges to do stuff and we'll make it happen for you. Um, and those two things are an amazingly powerful tools to have at our disposal as a as an agency leading the project which is what we did so um i guess what the rsc was able to give us was this huge um talent this huge acting resource um, in terms of the the um the actors themselves but also because they're, they're very well connected they were able to bring in people that we could never dream of bringing in as an agency um for example that the app is narrated by David Tennant, who is a, is a 
he's he's not only a world famous actor, but he's also an an, an RSC. I'm trying to remember what the correct word is. It's, um, but he's a he's a member of the RSC. Um, so he he's able to bring that passion and that expertise about Shakespeare, but also draw that huge audience that say, oh, that's David Tennant. I know him. He's Doctor Who. He's he's X, Y, and Z. Um, they, they were able to bring in Akala and Shloma because these are people who, who understand and appreciate the importance of Shakespeare. So underpinning all of this is a passion for Shakespeare. So we all had our own passion for Shakespeare, which, which uh, sort of, I mean, I studied in a, a degree and stuff, as I did an English degree, but probably like you, I didn't encounter him in quite the same way as we were trying to bring the experience to life um, for, for our audience. I mean, I think one of the one of the technological issues was, I guess, you know, shooting something in 3D. Now we, we look around. There's a lot of 3D experiences. But when this app was done, which was, uh, you know, going on going on two years ago, the, the shooting of it was, um, how do you shoot? How do you shoot on a stage? What's the best way to do it? Um, Unit nine shot with two different rigs. Um, uh, one of which looked amazing and had a, a, a sort of mushroom-shaped lens, and it sh they were shooting like 6K and stuff. But but in the end, they used a much simpler setup. They used uh, a, an array of GoPros because that was able to deliver a, a better quality image and things. So we were trying things on the fly to see how they worked and stuff. Um, obviously. Things like not being able to have anyone behind the camera is really difficult in a theatre where everything's exposed. So some of us were up in the heavens, some of us were down in the pits. You know, but that that's a different way of working, and we had to adapt to those those kinds of working and things. Um, once we had all the content, we had to stitch it together with a very strong look and feel that that would kind of bring different elements, static elements, uh, interactive elements, video elements together. Um, and I guess that was a challenge, like a giant jigsaw puzzle. How do we how do we bring it all together? And then I guess one of the one of the things was to make sure the app remains compelling after the first time. To, so how do we get richer layers of content? And that's where things like the augmented hotspots or the you know much much deeper levels of uh, engagement come in, which you only find if you if you play the app, if you go through the app and things. But it's trying to future proof it. Um, at, at the same time. There's restrictions. We had to deal with restrictions. So, for example, you can't allow 13-year-olds to share stuff without uh, of themselves without um, having some kind of moderation and things. So, so we realised very early on that what they could share was social stuff, which said what they were doing, but they couldn't share the, the thing they wanted to do. Um, and, and because it, it became a closed-in system, we had to make sure that within that that enclosed system, there was enough richness in able to allow individuals to play, but also groups to be involved and things. So it's just simple things like that that um, are thrown out. I guess... It's funny to you say simple things, but you're thinking about all these layers of complexity, yes. right? And then made the app a success. Um, but also about, uh, you know, you were talking about the importance of collaboration and having different skills on board and how this is becoming more and more relevant for digital work in general, right? It used to be that you could just sit down in a basement with a computer and code the thing and then have it out. And now it requires all these multiple things, especially because uh, in work like this, where it kind of breaks the digital barrier to be a digital physical experience, which is how we're built, right? We're physical beings. It's, it's fascinating to me to see how all these layers came into play and into place. Um, and, and I wonder, because one of the, you know, it's usually said that, you know, Generation Z, I guess, it's, it's uh, you know, students and, uh, and schools, you know, they have very short attention spans. This kind of, you know, schools are still trying to deliver knowledge in, in, a, in a very, at least for them, outdated way. So how, how do you work around this? You know, the fact that they might be easily distracted or, you know, this app is competing with a lot of other things they do in their devices, which usually usually are kind of you know um, very short and, and distracting. Yes, I mean I, I think you you sort of hit the nail on the head there. That it's all about their experience, not our experience. Um, I think we are guilty in advertising of standing in a box and shouting out and trying to be incredibly disruptive and things. Whereas now we can't we can't be like that. We have to be more. We have to be more discreet about how we work, and we have to be more 
understanding of the native environment that, that our audience is in. Um, this is an audience who love technology. They're very, very comfortable with technology. As you say, they, 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 look, for, they look for short engagement, but if it's rewarding enough, they'll piece together lots of short bits into a much longer, longer experience. So, so at the time, we looked around at what they were doing. We, were, we looked at you know things like dub smash stuff like that, um, where it's about it's about playing with words and playing with sound and playing with other people's voices in your faces and mashing it all up and things. Um, once you understand that that's what they like, um, that the content can be anything. I mean it. it you know, it can be it could be songs in dub smash or musically or whatever, but equally it could be Shakespeare in the re Shakespeare app because the mechanic is is the thing that's driving it. it. It's that reward, it's that instant reward. They you ask them to do something which is relatively complex, and what you get back is is rewarding enough to have warranted doing it in the first place. So with this, you you mime as a as an RSC actor says the words, but what you see back is you saying those words. Now if you then take the creative, the creative decision to make those two words either love lines or insults, so they can choose to either say the most romantic Shakespearean love line or the, the rudest Shakespeare insult, then that gives them that reward which encourages them to do it before. So I think it's about understanding what your, what your audience is, is, is into. And, you know, 450 years ago, people insulted each other and people told each other they loved each other. But, you know, if you're 13 now, that's basically life split up into either saying you love someone or saying you hate someone. So it's about understanding what they wanted from it and then giving them that and giving them it in a sort of rewarding way. So, so yeah, um, I, I, I would disagree that they have short attention span. Um, yeah, yeah, it's interesting it's, uh, um, because, because you build, there's different pieces, but the continuity is there, right? So you can decide to jump between one way of playing with it or, or using it to the other. Uh, but in the end, it all builds up to the final, you know, Shakespeare play. Which, yeah. which you know, I agree also on, on the short attention spans. I think it's a self, uh, um, how do you call them, you know, a uh, prophecy that makes true itself because we, we think that they want that and very often it's just us, you know, older people thinking about that and just yeah. instead of getting into their shoes and understanding why is it that they have short attention spans? Oh, maybe because what we are doing is boring, right? So they don't say yeah. that. Um, was there any way uh, in which you or the client wanted to measure the impact of, of, of the app and, and the whole experience? Were you measuring something? Um, I think because it was part of a CSR initiative, and as I said at the beginning, it, 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 was, it was supposed to feel like a gift. So it, it wasn't supposed to deliver any, against any hard metric for the client. A campaign, you know, uh, an ad or something where, you know, hard metrics rule, right? So. Yeah, so it was, it was nothing like that. Um, we were actually really set out to avoid that entirely because especially with this audience, if they think they're being sold to, they're going to walk away straight away. So um, I guess uh, anyone that's seen the, the, the case film for this, for this app, we took the we took the tablets into a into a classroom in Uxbridge on a on a cold um, November February morning, and we we looked at a class in an English class, and you know they were engaged, they loved it, they loved what they were doing. They had a brilliant teacher; she was doing a, a sterling job with it. Um, but when we gave them the, the the devices with the app on, it was like suddenly suddenly something clicked for them because they were they were suddenly doing what they do at home. Um, on their devices, but they were doing it with Shakespeare and they were doing it in a classroom. And I guess that that sort of that sort of is the way that we would measure it is is how rewarding did to the people who use it and what did they get out of it? Were they at the end, did they go from sitting down uh, to standing up and speaking out loud and things? And you know, I think if you look at the case film you'll you'll see that's very much that, that it the app is its own reward for people when, when they play it, but we were very keen to make sure that it, it didn't have to have any metrics, it didn't have to deliver on anything, just to be this, I guess, this gift, as Samson would see it. Yeah. Which, which is one of the sins, right, of the, of the ad world per se, that sometimes we 
we are so desperate for proving that something works that we force things just to generate certain metrics, which you know often are vanity or are not really. How do you measure the experience or the happiness or the interaction that you know the value that people are getting out? It's better to have one person that cares than a thousand that you know were just passively in front of the screen and never never really paid attention. Now talking about attention and surprises, what were you know? Uh, was there something that surprised you, either personally or, as, or you know, as as you were developing this this experience? Um, yeah, I I guess one of the one of the biggest surprises was how relevant Shakespeare actually is. Um, we thought we'd have a bit of a battle to co to convince you know a group of thirteen year olds that he was relevant and things, but actually. The themes that he deals with, and you know, when you begin to unpack the language, the language itself is is very, very relevant to them. You know, to, to have a rapper like Akala pointing out the difference, the, the, the similarities in what he says and what Shakespeare says, and the way they say it, and you know, the the, the devices that Shakespeare uses, the meter, the alliteration, the, the pentameter, um, all of those sort of things are are things that, that they're listening to every day in hip hop. And basically, it's, he's, he, was, he was an entertainer and he was a performer in the same way as you've got entertainers and performers now. And that relevance is, is still there. And it was great to see 13-year-olds understanding that. Similarly, with the themes, when you start unpacking the themes, when you start talking about you know, universal themes of love and betrayal and distrust and all of those, and suddenly you realize, well, that's happening around me. That's happening in the classroom. That's exactly what those two over there are doing. That's what, that, that's what he did to him at the weekend, and that's why he's annoyed. And when you realize that Shakespeare's things are, are universal, you begin to get a kind of affinity to it, and those 450 years suddenly disappear, and he's dealing with universal things. And I, I think for me, that was very surprising. Um, the other surprising thing was when you begin to unpack the potential of performance, how, how far we've got to go with technology uh, still. Although we were absolutely cutting edge with what we were doing at the time, um, my dream would be for somebody to be able to join a performance in the same way as we're in a hangout now, uh, wearing, a, wearing a VR headset, choosing what character you want to be, and then performing in a play where the rest of the characters are perhaps driven by, you know, they're, they're sort of an AI so they can respond to the way that you're performing. So if you perform in, a, in an uninspired way, then they'll get angry with you or whatever. That That's not a million miles away, um, but at the moment it's not here. And I think with everything, it's what do you do at that point in time to deliver the best possible experience? And I guess for me, the surprise was how much potential there is um, with this audience and with technology that we're, we're working with at the moment to deliver ever more compelling experiences. So, yeah. And if you think about it, in the end, you know, especially when you're talking about experiences and performances and stories, is you know, how do you hit that flow, right? And then once the audience hits that moment of flow, we, we stop thinking about the technology, but is it the certain technology, like the same way that theater or, or, or cinema and stuff was technology, but after you're immersed into it and, and when you're captured by it, you stop thinking about it, right? And we've always used technology to, to you know, express ourselves and tell stories. And you know, even if you think about Shakespeare it's, uh, and, and the themes being relevant, it's, it's you know, you, you see Macbeth and Game of Thrones and a part of the dragons and stuff, you know, it's, yeah. it's the same kind of cycle of, 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 yeah. of stories happening, right? Yes. Just yeah. you know, with a, maybe a different language or a different medium, you know, in this case, you know, uh, TV, but uh, it's, it's very much uh, the same. Um, this was a, a great behind the scenes of, of the project. Very often when you see something, uh, you know, you only see the final product, uh, but I find very interesting, you know, and in, in delving deeper into what went behind it, the skills that were brought on board, how this is in constant flux, you know, maybe if you had to start again today to do a similar project, you would take, uh, I don't want to say a radically different, you know, route, but probably different paths because there's other technology out there, there's more yeah. accessibility. Uh, you know, in this case, students are you know building on top of things. So if they went through the the uh, read Shakespeare, you know, in the past, now they might be ready for having a you know making another leap. So 
thank you, thank you for, for your time sharing this. Uh, on the Lobby Awards website, we're gonna share also the video, not only of this call, but also of the, of the case study with, with a few of the insights uh, you know, of, of how you made it and how it looked like and stuff. So, Mark, thank you very much for, for your availability. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing more you know, creative and amazing work from, from you and your team, so thank you very much. All right, thanks a lot, Jen. Thanks for well, cheers. See you later. Bye. Bye.